and thank you for having me and thank you for staying with me to this graveyard slot. Um, I really appreciate it. I've had a fantastic conference and I'm very pleased to have been here as the imposter that I am because I'm not an archaeologist. Don't walk that way. This way. Follow the arrows. Stop here and read this panel. Look at this. Don't touch that. This area is roped off for your safety. This area is not open to the public. This area is closed for conservation purposes. Don't walk that way. As a curious visitor, managed heritage sites can feel <coughs> like no-go areas. Excuse my cold. These historic buildings and spaces, subject to the frailties of funding, time and weather, are at constant risk. It's no wonder that sightseers bustling, knocking into things and nudging over fragile edges require management. And I don't blame curators and conservators for trying to shepherd me around in an exercise in damage limitation. But I'm a writer, and that makes me nosy. I'm intrigued by the past and the narrative and poetic possibilities of place. I'm also a psychogeographer, which means that like many people, I don't like being told what to do, where to walk and what to look at. If there is a fence, I want to see over it. If there is a closed door, I want to open it. And who wouldn't? What is kept from us is what sparks our curiosity. We begin to imagine what is beyond that fence, behind that door. We create scenarios. We interpret signs and clues and construct narratives. This desire to make sense of things and build stories around fragments is a practice that writers, historians and archaeologists and genuinely switched on visitors all share. The will to peer, ruminate and interrogate is something that any good visitor experience should provoke. So how can we embrace these tendencies and foster them within the constraints of managed heritage sites? How can we offer those rucksack-carrying tourists and sticky-fingered little children something really worthwhile without breaking the very thing they've come to see? One answer is to encourage a particular kind of walking, attentive walking informed by psychogeographical practices. And as I've pointed out, walking around a heritage site can be a frustrating experience, but the freedoms of walking and the attendant pleasures of pausing, imagining and narrating are vital to the public experience of those sites. <coughs> walking, given a basic level of fitness and comfort, can be a liberating act. The process of walking, the physical movement of it, removes us literally and metaphorically from the clutter of the everyday. As a visitor, when I'm walking across a field to view an abandoned water mill or climbing a hill to reach a ruined tower, I'm not concerned with the demands of home or work. Unless I'm plugged into a device, I'm not checking my email on the hoof or receiving calls. Instead, I'm removing myself from potential interruptions and entering a different mental space, a receptive state of mind that enables me to switch on my senses and be fully present in my surroundings. Added to this is the anticipation of a find, of coming upon something fascinating, unique, unexpected, of tapping into the past through an object in the landscape or a remnant of material culture. Frederick Gross speaks of this state of mind as the silence of walking. In his book, A Philosophy of Walking, this, he says, in the first place, is in the first place the abolishment, sorry, the abolishment, I always want to say abolition, the abolishment of chatter, of that permanent noise that blanks and fogs everything, invading the vast prairies of our consciousness like couch grass. Walking, my ears are open and my brain is ready for input. Do I want the free audio tour? No, thanks. <laughs> Let's return to the idea of attentive walking. What does this mean? I see it as a way of walking that embraces the spirit of the derive or drift, a psychogeographical practice described by Guy Debord as a technique of rapid passage through varied ambiences. Psychogeography is concerned with responding to and challenging the prescriptions of place. Inform me that I need to follow the interpretation panels in a set order and I will find an excuse to go through that exhibition backwards. The psychogeographer does not follow the path but walks against the crowd because creative engagement is only really possible by disrupting the flow, switching from passive reception to active perception. I won't go into a history of psychogeography here. Instead, I would like to glance briefly at a side sheet of this movement that is particularly appropriate, appropriate to heritage sites counter tourism. <coughs> oh, good. <laughs> Somebody's with me. I never know quite how to say this, but I will say it as Latterex. Latterex, the Laboratory of Experimental Tourism, was established by Joël Henri in 1990 with a view to finding new ways of seeing other places. 
Experimental tourism is not critical or snobbish about sightseeing, rather it is profoundly democratic and celebratory. For latter ex tourists, all experiences of travel and tourism, good and bad, absurd and impractical, are equally worthwhile. To, dem to disseminate this practice, Henri created the lonely planet guide to experimental travel, in which he and his collaborator, collaborator Rachel Anthony set out various games and approaches from the laboratory. In this book, the practice of counter-tourism is explained as follows. Hypothesis. Do the opposite of what you think a traveller should do. Method. Varies, but could include travelling to a famous landmark and taking a photograph of your back to the site. Alternatively, photographs and tourists practising classical tourism. Take the opposite approach to instruction. If your guidebook advises you to avoid something, deliberately seek it out. Also established in the 1990s, the artistic company Rights and Sites began to create site-specific performances and interventions with psychogeographical counter-tourist routes. Their practice evolved into the creation of misguides, performance walks and accompanying literature intended to transform participants' experiences of familiar places by exploring them in unexpected ways. Their A Misguide to Anywhere, published in 2006, is a series of instructions for creating self-led misguides including walking by following your own shadow, visiting roadworks as if they are archaeological excavations, or looking for hidden wormholes to other places. <laughs> this misguide also contains approaches for heritage sites and monuments, including my favourite for visiting memorials. This is it. A city marks its history in stone from the simple plaque to the statue to the clock tower to the war memorial. Once the names have been carved, it is rare to hear those words spoken aloud. Go with a friend to any marker in the city that may constitute a memorial and read aloud to each other these silent words and names. This sounding out of the forgotten past has a reverence to it that reflects how respectful counter-tourism really can be. And it is this combination of playfulness and appreciation that I recommend incorporating into walking heritage sites. And now apologies to William for the image that he's about to see. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I found a member of Rights and Sites, Phil Smith, has gone on to produce further misguides, including one directly applicable to heritage sites, Counter Tourism, the Handbook. In this and its smaller companion, Counter Tourism, a pocketbook, Smith reacts against the spectacle of the heritage industry, which he sees as offering a sanitised repackaging of historic sites. This is heritage with a J, akin to Muzak, the bland, washed out, digestible version of the past. Smith's handbook is subtitled a handbook for those who want more from heritage sites than a tea shop and an old thing in a glass case. It offers a series of provocations and principles for visitors wishing to shake up twee heritage and what Smith describes as the heritage tourism machine. This includes taking a stance against health and safety signs, those restrictions and warnings that psychogeographers itch to disobey. But rather than putting oneself in physical peril, Smith suggests a more metaphorical interpretation. Many unnecessary health and safety signs can be usefully reinterpreted. For example, the sign, historic sites can be dangerous, please take care, erected outside English heritage sites should be taken seriously. If the past eats your brain, your vacant <laughs> smile will be taken for customer satisfaction. <laughs> Ways of walking feature in Smith's guides, including prowling, walking barefoot, walking across a site as if it were on a thin skin of ice, and a favourite psychogeographical chestnut, misreading the site map by holding it upside down. <laughs> Smith doesn't want to cause trouble at heritage sites, and he's clear about not disrupting the pleasure of others. His reason for adopting these strategies is to burst the bubble of the heritage business. And he says, Behind those simple-sounding stories in the visitor guide and the locked gates marked private, there lies a multitude of wonders, absurdities and outrages that when counter-tourism opens the doors, provide a subversive and life-twiddling experience rather than a deferential procession through the unrevealing homes of the rich and famous. It's not because the heritage industry is dull or bad or conservative or inaccurate, <coughs> but it just doesn't seem to realise how odd, surreal, dreamy, horrific, elusive, ruined and apocalyptic all it is. Like Smith, I want, to, I want us to re-enchant and defamiliarise no, I'll try that again. De re enchant and defamiliarise heritage sites and spaces so that we can see them afresh and better appreciate their richness. 
And I believe that we can do this by bringing together the playful tenets of counter-tourism and the inquiring practice of attentive walking. This is how I've been doing it. So in 2016, I worked on two projects with English heritage sites using this approach. I was invited to visit Wilmer Castle in Kent by the senior curator who'd recently completed a major redisplay project there. She asked me to train, train the site's team of newly recruited volunteer room guides in using psychogeographical approaches. This is quite a shock to me. It's certainly a shock to them. In the resulting workshop, I asked participants to derive around the site following their curiosity and using psychogeographical provocations to discover spaces and objects they had not previously noticed. The purpose of this project was to look at different ways of working with material heritage in enclosed hands-off spaces, as well as making the most of the extended grounds. Volunteers took part in defamiliarising exercises with objects to encourage them to question the act of interpretation, and then worked in small groups to create their own misguided tours of items and spaces in the site. They presented these tours to each other and some curious visitors, bringing together walking, creative interpretation and storytelling. Armed with these techniques, I hope that volunteers felt better equipped to deal with understimulated visitors, especially those sticky finger children who kept wanting to get underneath those red ropes. And this is me having misguided them slightly, they're now misguiding each other. <laughs> Following this project, I worked with curatorial and interpretation staff from English Heritage at St Augustine's Abbey in Canterbury. This is a very different kind of site, open air, ruined walls, and little tangible or tactile heritage. The brief was to improve visitor experience to the site, especially those of families. Attentive walking and imaginative responses were key to this. Working with a family forum drawn from local English Heritage members, we created a series of indoor and outdoor activities to help young visitors engage with the spaces and their stories. The most tangible meeting of walking and counter-tourism in the resulting interpretation items is the collection of monks' habits available for visitors to wear. Well, that's me uh, misguiding people in the habits when we launch them. Inside each habit is stitched this panel. It's the inevitable trail of the site, but it's got a series of games and provocations um, as part of it, including spot a spotting list for playing heritage bingo, storytelling through mime in the refectory area, and reading an imaginary manuscript in the cloister. This has proved very popular with the children, apparently, and means that they keep asking to go back rather than going, oh God, not there again. <laughs> <laughs> I live in the medieval sink called a sandwich in Kent, which is a place that I long felt needed an injection of counter-tourism. And in the summer of last year, I ran a project to achieve just this. Walking Heritage was funded by the Heritage Lottery Fund and supported by my institute, Canterbury Christchurch. The project comprised working with local community and history groups, town archives, English Heritage and the Royal Geographical Society to create alternative guided walks in the town. For example, an animal spotting safari encouraged families to look again at the architecture they passed every day, and a tour of ghost pubs visited sites that were once public bars. I produced accompanying literature for the project, including a misguide walking sideways in Sandwich, which Phil Smith agreed to collaborate on. And the Not the Blue, tour, black, blah, Not the Blue Plaque Tour of Sandwich, a self-led walking tour of town tales, undocumented histories and local legends. And I have copies available. Yes, please. Yes, please. please take them away, because I've carried them all the way from Sandwich, so I'm very grateful for that. My last case study. My most recent project in this vein explores sites in Canterbury through the lens of literature. Oh, What We've Been was funded by the Being Human Festival of the Humanities this year. My colleague Mike Bintley and I worked on a text each and collaborated on this project, which launched in November. It comprises an imaginative mapping of our chosen texts, in my case, Ridley Walker by Russell Hoban. Oh. And... Oh! oh. oh. <laughs> you darling. <laughs> and, uh, and in Mike's case, the old English poem Andreas, which he had just um, translated, onto the cityscape using a trail that connects resonant sites. These included Canterbury Cathedral and but Butter Market, the ancient town walls, the Westgate Tower, and the Dame John Mound, for anyone that knows Canterbury. Mike and I offered joint misguided walks of the trail during the festival, reading from the texts and connecting them to the fabric of the ancient city as well as encouraging walkers to seek further parallels in busy streets and back lanes. Printed and downloadable maps of the trail are available. <laughs> Please take them away. 
as is a virtual online tour of the project on the project website, as you can see. The project covered an area of heritage <coughs> sites, exploring the symbiotic relationship of text and place, and offered a process of creative interpretation through walking. I hope that this very brief tour has made something of a case for employing attentive walking and counter-tourism to sites of historic interest. If we cannot climb the fence or open the door, we can find imaginative ways of leaping over and walking through them, uncovering and reading our own stories of the past. Thank you. Thank you.